<laughs> All right. And actually, I'm also going to, um, I'm going to turn off the waiting room. That way people can just log in and I don't have to keep an eye on it. I don't think we'll get Zoom Bomber. So uh, welcome, everybody. So good to see you all here. Uh, my name is Christine Shoemaker. I know I know some of you and some of you I haven't met yet. Um, I am the director of Shoebox Projects, and I'm the founder of Shoebox Arts, which is a support network for artists. And I also am the publisher of Art and Cake, which is an online art magazine um, based in L.A., but we do some stories outside of L.A. Right now, um, we're doing a lot of artist interviews because I want to focus on artists. So, um, yeah, and <clears throat> excuse me, I'm also an artist myself. And if you'll excuse me, I'll probably be drinking water a lot because I just did a talk this morning too. So of course my voice is already starting to crack. Um, but I, uh, I'm i also an artist, a multidisciplinary artist. So my a lot of my work is based on the idea, you know, whatever it is. And then I, I kind of work the medium around that. So, um, so I was kind of mentioning before I turned on the recording, that um, Shoebox Projects, it was a physical space where I live at the brewery in Los Angeles. And then with the pandemic, um, we went online. And the physical space, I had both group exhibitions, and it's a small space, it's not that big at all. Um, and also artist residencies. Um, artists would use the space for three weeks for the, as a studio, and then they would have an exhibition of the work they've created. And we did that for three or four years, and it was a lot of fun. And then I also had a broom closet that I turned into a gallery and I had artists create installations in the broom closet. And that was a lot of fun too. So now it's back to being a broom closet. <laughs> so, but it has lights in it because one of the artists put lights in it. So now, you know, that's exciting. And it can go back to a, you know, to a gallery eventually. Maybe we'll see. I don't know. <laughs> but um, I, you know, I was kind of mentioning earlier that, um, I always, I'm a curator. I've curated, you know, a lot of in-person exhibitions and I'm an idea person. So I have ideas floating through my mind all the time about shows I want to put together, about, um, uh, yeah, stories I want to write, which is like on the back burner totally. But I'm always coming up with different ideas and especially about exhibitions, especially about like, you know, I see a lot of, I see a lot of art and I see like commonalities between art and, you know, not just because it's in the zeitgeist, but I don't know. It's, I mean, that's part of it because of the world that we live in, but, um, but yeah, I just, I have a good eye for things like that. And so when I curate an exhibition, you know, I just, I want to see who else is doing that. And so, you know, being able to do these calls allows me to meet new artists who are doing very similar things in different ways. And so that was exactly text message. Um, it was so cool to see, you know, all of the different, different ways that artists use text, you know, and like, I think um, like one artist, I think she posted on social media. I don't know if she is able to be here today, Dougie. She, she may be, she's one of the only painters. There's a couple of painters, but um, there aren't that many painters. It's, and I didn't even think about that. That was, oh, there she is. I didn't even think about that. It's like, you know, but I just, I don't know. I just went with what I saw. So anyway, um, I, you know, thank you all for being here and participating in the exhibition. Um, I, when I put it together, cause I curated it, I, like I had all of the artwork in a folder and I kept moving it all around and moving it around is not the easiest thing because I had to keep renaming them. And so like they went in a certain order. I, I try to be as organized as I can, but, um, but I had fun with it. And then I had it all down. I had the order that I wanted. I put it all in WordPress because that's the website that Shoebox Projects is in. And then I started, I'm like, wait, no, this needs to go up here. And I started moving it around again. And so um, I'm really, really happy with the order that it all, you know, came in that, um, that I came up with. And, you know, and I hope you were able to, as you went through it, kind of see the, 
you know, see the themes, the, you know, the concept that I was going for and how it changed and, you know, flowed and stuff like that. Um, so how these, nor the, how these artist talks, and actually I love, I think Karen had said artist walkthrough. And I'm like, I didn't think about that for an online exhibition, but I love that. So I'm, I'm going to start calling them artist walkthroughs. And, um, you know, because it is a walkthrough through an online exhibition. Um, and I, I think, is Karen still here, Karen Carlson? Oh, there you are, Karen. Um, <laughs> my my uh, internet died, so oh, I'm, no. I'm on my phone. Yeah. <laughs> well, welcome back. Um, but yeah, so it is because, I mean, I love to hear from the artists. I mean, I know, like, from, you know, a lot of the artists put a little blurb about their work, which I love, yeah. which thank you for that. But, you know, but you don't know. So I love, you know, I think artist talks are so much better than art receptions, because, you know, you can actually hear, hear what the work is about and, you know, the backstories and stuff like that. So, um, so yeah, so that's why I do. I mean, this is kind of a reception. It's an artist talk, but it's, I love the walkthrough. So, um, so with that, um, what I'll do is if you want to talk about your work, and actually what I should do is I'm going to share my screen. So we'll have the exhibition um, in front of us. And what I'll do is I'll take a couple minutes and just kind of flow through the exhibition and do a little bit, just kind of do a talk about how I came up with the flow. And then um, if you're here and you want to talk about your work, you can go ahead and raise your digital hand um, using the reactions menu. And, um, and we'll, you know, I will, if you don't know, it's at the bottom, it's the happy face that says reactions. And then there's a little button that says raise hand. And so, um, yeah, so you can click on that. And then I'll just go in that order and um, let you, you know, just take a couple minutes because there's quite a few of the artists here. And, you know, just tell us about the work. Tell us, you know, um, what it's about and what, you know, what the idea is and stuff like that. So, let me go ahead and share my screen. All right. Um, so um, I, you know, as I was going through the, um, all of the artwork, one of the things that struck me right away was how abstracted some, a lot of the text was and how artists, you know, manipulated text to almost, like you couldn't read the letters. And, you know, I mean, I was trying, I'm like, wait, what letters are those? Um, and I just like that manipulation of, you know, just, yeah, how text is used as line, you know, as drawing, as, you know, like taken out of the context of what it really means. And this was what I saw at first. And I saw it from quite a few artists, um, you know, so this work from Ian, and then, um, and, you know, I've seen a few artists who do like similar things like Lisa, and it's like, you know, you kind of can read it and, and there's just something poetic about it. There's something like, you know, you really have to concentrate and, um, and it, it does something to your eyes and yeah, I don't know. There's just something about how, how text, again, it, it's taken out of the context of actually being text and actually being like the meaning is gone from what the words mean, what the letters mean, from what the idea of text means to, to this like just mark making. It's like just down to mark making. And so, um, you know, artists like Chris, Christopher Taylor and there's another artist in just a second, how they use it, like mix it within you know, abstract painting, using line, using color. Um, and, you know, and even, you know, the poetry of the, you know, text of the statements, the messages that are being told, you know, are really important too. This was another artist that uh, Fred, whose artwork, um, you know, you tried to read the text, but again, it's taken, it's, it totally changes the meaning of what text is. You know, you want to read it, but you can't. And that's, I don't know, it just, it does play with your mind. Um, this was, you know, another one by um, Stephen who, yeah, it's like, there's so much, the text is actually a part of the paint. It's like 
a part of the media or a part of the technique of you know the brushstroke it's like you have brush strokes you have drawing and you have text so it becomes a part of the cohesiveness of the painting if that makes sense um, and then Lori, whose, you know, letters kind of are all mixed together, you know, in that abstracted form in the same way, but hers like, you know, becomes a little more um, transparent or in that you can actually, you know, kind of read the letters more, but then you're like, okay, wait, the order has changed, you know, the order is different. So we'll let her talk about her work in a minute. Um, and then we get into like how, you know, like this work by Marie uses um, typewriter ribbon. And, you know, I really love that. And it's another one where you can't really, you have to look really close to see the text. And, you know, of course, seeing it in person is a totally different story. But, um, you know, another one, Brianna, who, and I love how artists are using, especially in fabric, and material and this moving blanket. I saw that immediately. I'm like, oh, I have a few of those, um, you know, and again, how the the geometric forms of that she has cut out, like in the moving blanket, you know, also cut into the text and abstracted in a different way. And also just the text on top of each other, it becomes mark making. Um, and then Deborah here, who, you know, again, it's like sewing as mark making. And we'll, she'll be able to talk about her work in a few minutes too, if she wants. Um, and then artists who, you know, like create, and this is, oh, was somebody saying something? Oh, okay. Um, you know, artists like Deborah, and this was, I did this transition where, you know, because Deborah does a lot of book art, you know, handmade book art. And, you know, and I saw that in Sean's work. And so I wanted to kind of transition to show, you know, how artists are using text in, in different ways like that. And it's not a traditional book. You know, it's like, it's a box. It's this kind of assemblage put together. And there's other artists further down that also do assemblage. Um, and then Caro, who, you know, I mean, I just love the, the play of these two together, where this one doesn't have any text at all, that you can see, but actually I was kind of thinking about, you know, the pattern as text, and, you know, and what that means, but then, you know, when you place these two next to each other, there's just something kind of conceptual about it, um, you know, and I love that, these be, the letters become objects. So that was a different way of seeing text. Um, and then of course the message, you know, that is being said. Um, this work by Isabella, um, you know, definitely, I well, especially, and I admit a lot of my work is about body image and my eating disorder. So anytime I see stuff about body and how it's presented through art, you know, I, I pay a little closer attention to. And so this work really struck, you know, struck me. There's, there was a lot of work that was kind of similar that was um, submitted in that, you know, artists using collage, you know, in text, but I really liked how, um, how Isabella, you know, used, like, she also used symbolism, you know, the text as symbolism in, you know, what she was doing. Um, and B, I don't know if B's here, um, hopefully she'll be able to talk about her work. Um, you know, she did a call and response that was text. And so I really liked, you know, her play, her use of text along with performance art and along with, um, you know, just like how words, I don't know, shape who you are in as far as the performance art. And then this was like her thesis and so I totally love that. And hopefully she'll be here to talk about that. Um, and then Gigi, this was, and I hope I'm pronouncing names correctly. Um, this was a, her also a thesis, um, sports medicine, and it involves dancing and poetry and text. If you haven't watched the videos, go back and watch them because they're so, so good. And we're not going to have a chance to watch them, you know, in the exhibition. But um and give me just a second here. I'm sorry, I'm not able, I'm not keeping an eye out. Oh, good. That was the other thing. And I'm so glad, um, Monica, thank you for doing that. Um, please, you know, share your Instagram and your websites and everything in chat. 
because I'm all about building community and Monica knows that. So she got us started there. All right. And then, um, and this piece by Margaret, you know, I love the installation of, you know, all of these, you know, these chalkboards that, you know, you use in school or that you use to play with. And then to see some of these statements on there that um, hopefully she's here and she'll be able to talk about it, but it's really, really powerful. And it has to do with being a, you know, a, a kid in school today and what they go through, you know, what they're dealing with. Um, and then David's, you know, this was so funny. This was so fun. And especially the ice cream one, because that's like my binge food. But, um, you know, yeah, these, you know, very, um, uh, oh gosh, what's the word now? You said it in your statement and oh, semiotic, um, you know, these like semiotic statements are, you know, just great. And hopefully he'll talk about these too. And then there's some political work, um, you know, all about like the drought and water and, um, you know, yeah, what's going on. I mean, <coughs> sorry, I knew this would happen. Hopefully my voice doesn't go out and hopefully I'm not going to talk much longer because I'm going to let you guys talk, but I just wanted to give like a quick walkthrough of my, you know, myself. Um, but there were, you know, there's a few and there were a lot of political statements that were submitted, um, but I really like, you know, these were more clever and more um, not clever, but smart. And, you know, I love the technique and the process of creating these statements and these messages. Um, and, you know, we'll talk about those as we, you know, go through, um, you know, go through them. And hopefully, like I said, the artists are here. And also, you know, the three-dimensionality that of artists using text, you know, in a three-dimensional way. And we'll look at that too. Um, and also how, um, you know, like Darlene is using, you know, again, fabric, you know, to get these powerful messages. And you should definitely go to her website. Hopefully she'll post it because she has more of these shirts that I didn't include them all, but um, there's, you know, really, really important messages that need to be said. Um, this one by Lorraine, also the same thing. It's like how these messages are being conveyed um, using fabric and using, you know, like bullet holes. I mean, um, yeah, just again, so powerful. Um, clothing, you know, using text, um, the same thing again, fiber art, fabric, um, and how, you know, how again, the text is abstracted. So you really have to pay close attention and you really have to look close which I think you should do for all art anyway. And so it actually makes you really spend a longer time looking at the work. Um, and then Dougie Wallace um, and her, like, these are just gorgeous. They're paintings, they're with pastel. And, you know, I just love how she uses text in an inspirational, you know, and powerful way. Um, you know, more same thing like mixed media. Um, and we'll look at those closer. You know, some of these are like cut off because of the cropping, but, you know, again, if you go and look at these later on, you'll be able to see them, you know, larger. Um, I love the difference, you know, the way that artists are um, emulating like different styles, like illuminated manuscripts and, you know, using like ancient text, um, but in a contemporary way. So I saw that. Um, playing out and especially like I love this by Melanie Grown Ups Alphabet uh, first alphabet and there's a video here of the book um, I think it's funny and it's smart and you know definitely take a look at it um, and then moving like to thinking about letters in the alphabet um, Tyler and these at the way he abstracts letters and the way he abstracts you know these are like things that you type in text you know oops mm-hmm Oh yeah, you know, um, these were great too. These were fun. Um, and again, I mean, this reminded me of like kind of an ancient, you know, either an illuminated manuscript <coughs> or a tapestry um, and the same thing. And actually, and look how big, 72 inches. The same thing with Renee's, 
<clears throat> when I, gosh, sorry. <clears throat> when I was looking at these, this is what happens when I talk too much. <laughs> um, when I was looking at these originally, I didn't realize how big they were, but um, 60 inches, 72 inches, and they're so intricate and, you know, and really beautiful. Um, Backgrounds here, he'll be able to talk about, this is a community, kind of community engaged artwork. Uh, where he uses statements from um, <clears throat> that he received from people. And uh, <clears throat> let's see, Candace. Um, again, <laughs> <clears throat> I may have to stop in a second. Um, I love how Candace uses, I mean, food, you know, as um, using the text in food. And so I'm going to go ahead and because my voice is about to go out. Um, you know, we'll be looking at other, the rest of the artists also down here, but um, go ahead, Lori, if you want to go ahead and start and talk about your work. Um, and yeah, give us, you know, take a couple of minutes and tell us and, you know, other artists, if you want to go ahead and raise your digital hand and um, we'll take a look at your work too. So go ahead, Lori. Hi, everyone. Um First of all, Christine, this is such a fabulous exhibit. I love these pieces. They're so unique. I, I mean, I'm honored that you picked me when I see all the rest of the work. It's just amazing. Um, so anyway, this, this piece does have a story behind it. I was working on a, a large four feet by five feet political painting and in the background of the painting, it was an oil painting. And in the background of the painting, I had 21 realistic rendered faces of people in all sorts of despair, crying, angry, shouting, praying, depressed, you know, men, women, children. And and there was a Trump and Melania doll in front of all these people with the title of I really don't care. And um, I spent six months working on this painting. And at one time trying to do these faces, I just became so frustrated. I wanted to take a knife and just rip up this canvas that I had been working on for so long. And I really didn't want to do that. So I thought I have to turn my attention away from this canvas and I have to pour out my frustration on something else. So I did this work, which is called, I am so frustrated. And if you can see in the upper left-hand corner, there's like a very faint eye. And then that leads down into the I am and then the so and then the mass of letters, which is frustrated, all mixed up and jumbled. And um, I really like this piece because to me, well, first of all, it saved me from ruining my painting because I got out all my frustration on this piece of paper. But it really, to me, is sort of, um, it, it, it physically represents how we, or expresses, how we feel when we're frustrated, because you have this circling energy inside of you that won't stop, but everything's in conflict with each other. So you've got one side of the painting that is really, or the drawing that is really jumbled up, and then the other side, which is sort of clear, but they keep on rotating through each other. And, and I just thought it's the perfect rendition of how one feels when they're frustrated. And, um, and then on the right hand side, it's very faint, but in the white, around the edges of the whitish block, I have written in pencil again, I am so frustrated, I am so frustrated in very tiny letters. And it's mixed media because the dark black letters are actually plastic stick on letters. So that's it, thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Laurie. You know, um, 
when I saw this, I laughed because I, you know, it's like, yeah, you need like this visual, um, this visual, like, you know, of what it means to be frustrated. And I was thinking about it. I have a hard time feeling my feelings and even recognizing my feelings. So it kind of helped. It's like, oh yeah, I am frustrated. <laughs> it was like this good visual cue, you know, and now it's like, oh yeah, I can actually say that, <laughs> that you know, I'm frustrated. So, but no, it's, you know, it's a perfect example of that. So um, thank you so much. And I love the writing, the small writing too. How you wrote, I am frustrated. Yeah, thank you. So, you're welcome. Well, thank you. Oh. Christine, how do we save the chat? Um, I will save it. I'll send it to everybody um, after this. I'll send a, um, a link to the video and also I'll send the chat to everybody. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Um, all right, Fred, let's see. Go ahead. Well, hello, everyone. Hi. I'm, I'm delighted to be here and so honored to be part of this show with all of you. And I'd like to talk uh, mostly about the two large pieces that you see framing the one in the center. So there are obviously three different paintings, yes. And this one is titled Color Field. And it says Color Field over and over and over again. Like the old preacher said, you have to tell them and then you tell them again and then you tell them what you told them. And it's simply a grid um, freehand, um, painted um, with a brush, mostly, um, some oil stick also, and some um, China marker. And it says color field in a grid in each different direction. I would turn the painting around and around and form the grid that says color field until the text breaks down and I paint into the shapes created by the letters and it becomes a simic um, and therefore non-semantic. Um, the companion piece, uh, no loitering, no, the next one, no loitering was a response to a criticism that a well-meaning artist friend gave me about another one of my paintings when she said, you need to build in a place for my eye to rest. There's no place for my eye to rest. <laughs> and so I thought, well, you don't understand color field painting. And so I painted no loitering. And it's painted the same way with a grid of letters. I paint into the shapes created by the letters until the letters begin to um, break down and it becomes a simic and the color field emerges. Uh, these are large paintings. They're 75 inches by 45 inches um, stretched canvas. I build the stretcher frames and stretch the canvas. I'm very proud of the craftsmanship that I employ. They're two inches thick on the edges. I paint right around the edges in a way that's completely integral with the rest of the painting. And uh, Christine was right. These do fool the, fool the eye <laughs> because um, the, the brain desperately wants to try to make sense of the subject matter that it sees. And when it can't read something literally, it begins begins to try to intuit or or even um, impute meaning where there perhaps isn't any meaning, and it creates a strong sense of visual interest. It draws the viewer in, and my intention is to draw the eye in, have it go around and around the painting with nowhere to rest, and yet the field is cohesive and doesn't blow apart off the edges. It is a cohesive um, single painting. So anyway, I think that's enough said from me. I know there's others waiting in the queue. All right, I'll say one a few things about, this painting is much more semantic. Um, it actually has some poetry that, that I wrote. It starts off with the idea, what happens to this piece of canvas when it is covered in paint? <laughs> Which is of course ironic and uh, you know, the implication is, does it automatically become art or not? And then there's some poetry. I, I practice Zen Buddhism. So there's some, always some references to some Zen philosophy intermixed in my stuff. Um, sitting, watching clouds arise, 
uh, attached to loss and regret, karma piled high as a mountain, examining microscopic dust, things like that. Um, but again, the, the text has become so obscured by the act of painting itself that it is no longer strictly literal in the sense that it's easy to read. The other thing is that part of the text is painted down from the top and then I flip the canvas over and paint the other part down. So some of it you have to turn your head upside down to read. Then there's little words. Um, and I use graphite and I sometimes scribe directly into the wet paint with the graphite. And there's all kinds of tiny messages and fragments of words floating within the painting itself. So awesome. thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. I'm just going to go out so everybody can see all three of them together again. Um, yeah, you know, I, um, uh, what was I going to say? Oh, uh, where are you located? Sorry, I muted myself. Oh, that's okay. Um, I'm, I'm located in Denver, Colorado. Oh, okay, okay. A friend of I, mine curated an exhibition a couple of months ago, um, Heather Lowe on Asymic um, Art, and it was really great. And yeah, we have know, a, yeah, we have a really vibrant art scene here in Denver. I currently have a show up at the 931 Gallery with Mark Broswell, awesome. and I have some wonderful, I have a painting that is 120 inches by 79 inches. Wow. Uh, the big patterned color field piece. Uh, it's just really a great scene here. We, we really love, uh, we really love Denver. Oh, good, good. That's awesome. Well, these are beautiful. And thank you so much for participating and being part of the exhibition. Thank you, Christine. You're welcome. You're welcome. Um, all right. Let's see. Karen Fior uh, Fiorito. Is that? <laughs> yes, uh, Fiorito. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. So these are two um, screen prints. Um, unfortunately, like the photos aren't the best, but I have one of them here, actually, too. <laughs> Just being oh, cool. Thank one. you. <laughs> um, but uh, these are part of a, um, actually a billboard campaign that I had um, from 2015 to, I guess, the last billboard I did was. Uh oh. Voices. Oh. You're kind Sorry, of getting in and out, Karen. Is that oh, me or just or everybody? Sorry. Hello. Can you hear me? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I can hear you now. Okay. Um, so these are part of. Uh, I had a billboard project. Um, I had two different billboards up in Los Angeles. These aren't the billboard. They're posters based off of the billboard. So there's ones, but these are just showing. Um, how many gallons of water it takes to make certain foods. Um, so the campaign, it was a billboard that talked about um, how, you know, we were told during the drought in the beginning that to save water, we should cut down on our showers and, and um, you know, not water our lawns and wash our cars and do all this stuff. Um, and so my friend and I, um, we came up with this billboard campaign and it was called Got Drought. Mm -hmm. And it's about how animal agriculture um, uses 46% of California's water. Um, actually, probably more than that. It's like 50, you know, almost 50%. And how residential use is only 4%. So really you save a lot more water if you were vegetarian or vegan and if you just stopped or just reduced your meat consumption because California raises a lot of meat for consumption, a lot of cattle, um, and that's very destructive to the environment. Also, um, cattle is alfalfa, which is a very water intensive crop. So it uses intense amounts of water um, 
it's all done but like lead irrigation. So the billboard is, um, if you want to go to gotdrought.info, it changed from gotdrought.com, but gotdrought.info. Um, I have all the, it's a really good website. It has a lot of facts and, and shows our billboards, but the billboard said, you know, if you want to save 1300 gallons of water, you can either not flush your toilet for six months, not take a shower for three months, or for lunch, don't eat one burger. So it was trying to bring home to people the amount of water that we use to um, and that we consume just by eating. And you can see on the poster, 13 gallons of water for, you know, a, a hamburger, according to um, most recent sources. So also on our website, we have a water calculator. So you can like type in, you know, beer or it has drinks and and food or hot dog or whatever and it'll show you how much water is um used to make that certain food um yeah so in so these are hand pulled screen prints that i we designed based on this um this campaign that we had um and then we made t-shirts also and the t-shirts are backs like um, carne asada tacos and one was like spaghetti and so you know like I ate spaghetti today instead of you know a hamburger and I saved this much water um and we had a recipe book whole campaign <laughs> from 2015 to like um 2020 like I said and we had about 20 billboards um mostly in California San Diego San Francisco LA um all up and down California Sacramento and um Fresno um kind of hit everywhere. and um also had two that were in South Africa in Cape Town um in 2018 that were converted to liters instead of gallons um so that's what this works about. <laughs> well, thank you so much. It was definitely an eye opener for me. And, you know, I was when I was looking at it, I'm like, really, that's a hamburger. And I have trouble drinking 24, 20, 25 ounces mm -hmm. of water a day. I mean, it um, but no, it's, you know, um, I'm definitely going to go to the website and look some more and you know, see what I could do because that's, it's crazy. And that's what art does. It's like, you know, it educates, you know, and that's what we need. So thank you for that. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, all right. The other Karen. Let's see. Oh, there we go. <laughs> so um, I very rarely, if ever, use text in any of my <laughs> artwork. Um, so this is the one piece I had uh, when I saw your call go out, Christine. So um, and it may also be the smallest piece in the, sh in, the in your show. Um, it's about six inches square and four and a half inches high. Um, so this piece is composed of an origami bowl um, filled with folded paper, printed paper fortune cookies. Um, and it's kind of a fun little piece. Um, it was inspired by um, actually the, the detritus of, you know, uh, going to art openings in Chinatown back before the pandemic and, and, you know, going out for Chinese food afterwards and always seeing, you know, people leaving their fortune cookies behind on the table. And, you know, the, you just enjoyed a meal, hanging out with your friends and, you know, you've, and you're presented at the end of the of your meal with a traditional Chinese fortune cookie, and most of them just lie broken on the table, and no one eats their cookies. Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> Except for me, maybe. Um, <laughs> me too. <laughs> but, and I think that you know the in the rush to get to that little piece of paper that might have your lucky numbers on it, your lottery winning numbers, or or some you know some fortune for for the you know coming week, people are forgetting that they've just gotten a free cookie. You know, and so these are all printed with the words, the fortune is the cookie and they're, they're printed with rubber stamps. So I hand stamped um, all those little cookies and except for one cookie, um, all of the cookies are stamped, but the papers are blank. And then there's, there's one fortune cookie where the paper is actually um, stamped and they all say the fortune is the cookie, the cookie is the fortune. 
I and love it's, it. And, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, it's, it's, it's really kind of about the rush to get to something and forgetting what else you've been given <clears throat> along the way. I love that. <laughs> and I mean, you know, as a compulsive overeater, I would never leave the cookie. <laughs> <laughs> I would never leave anything sweet behind. So. I know, exactly, <laughs> exactly. But I will say I've seen this in person too, in ink and clay, so. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, so no, it's- Oh, that's right. You, you, were, you were one of the uh, jurors for that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yep. yep. So full transparency. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, um, but yeah, no, it's such a great, a great work about such a bigger topic. You know, it's like, again, using, you know, using food in this way to, um, yeah, to talk about what we leave behind and why. And yeah, thank you for that. Thank you for the message. It was, it was, it was a fun piece to do. And I, I, I have it on a list somewhere to try and recreate this on a much larger scale. Ooh, I'd love that. Us, using the same, same techniques, which would be quite interesting. So yeah, <laughs> yep. <laughs> that would be great. Well, thank you so much. Oh, thank you for having me. It's a beautiful show. You're welcome. You're welcome. Uh, all right, Darlin. Hello there. Darlin Susan Yee. Um, the piece behind me is the first piece that I ever did that had text on it, surprisingly enough. <laughs> and uh, I got so into that concept, it was germinating in the back of my mind. Well, during pandemic lockdown, I was presented with an opportunity to show uh, a solo show at Gallery 825. And I'm like, oh boy, how am I gonna fill this huge space? And it, we're in lockdown. Well, I started knitting like crazy, like absolute crazy. And I started coming up with these concepts of, of the, the phrases that we were seeing and hearing on the news. And my thought process was that these are things that have been reoccurring through history. This is nothing new. Why are we having to revisit this again? And so all of this was angry, angry, protests, crazy people out there in the streets on one side or the other side of the issue, conflict with each other. And I was locked down in my home, feeling like I couldn't get out among all of this conflict. And what could I do? Well, I thought, if I could express these thoughts in such a way that it grabbed attention. These are 120 inches wide, 84 inches tall. They're huge. Each phrase is like a billboard almost. So that when you're surrounded by these pieces, they, they are assembled in the room, almost like they're holding hands with one another. They're in concert with one another. But that was a lot of knitting and a lot of crocheting, a lot of adornment. And I'm, I'm working to complete the full series. Uh, the next one on my list is vote like your life depends on it. I feel really strongly that we need a voice and we need to exercise that voice. And the way we do that is to vote. Vote our thoughts, so vote what we mean. So that is what this work is about, um, getting all the, that anger out in a way that I could during lockdown. I'm sure I'm not the only artist who was influenced heavily by COVID-19 and uh, the lockdown and the, all of the protests in the streets. And uh, some of the other pieces are Black Lives Matter and Stop Asian Hate. 
very personal for a lot of people. And um, I'm just grateful I had have had an ongoing means to showcase this work. It is very large. It doesn't show, tran it transports well, but it, uh, it is very difficult to gain a commitment from a gallery. So it's, it's an interesting journey. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for uh, allowing me to speak on behalf of my art. Well, you're welcome. You're welcome. And I mean, thank you for doing this. We need to, you know, we need to hear these over and over again. You know, these phrases, we need to hear the stories. We need to, you know, um, we, the message, you know, it's repetition. We, you know, it just, because it's not going away, you know, so um, and that's why we, you know, that's one of the reasons we do art is to, you know, to get our message out there, to challenge people and, you know, thank you for doing this. And I remember sure. seeing photos of your solo show and I remember, you know, being able to see the size definitely helps and they're, you know, they're large and I can't imagine, I mean, how many are you going to have total in the series? I'm shooting for 20. Okay. And I currently have seven and three quarters. <laughs> I got, I uh, relocated my studio to Gardena. And in that process, um, I've had to downscale a lot of things. <laughs> I, I was blessed with a very large studio in Mar Vista and relocating to Gardena to an in-home studio. Mm. I'm like, oh, I can't carry it all with me. What am I gonna do? You know, so yeah. re-examining the concept of working big, but also enjoying the process of working so big and just working like a banshee and just getting it out there as yeah. I'm feeling it. One thing I did want to mention, it was so rewarding at the solo show to have a visitor, a, a tiny tyke. I'm guessing he was about seven or eight years old. And he stood in front of each and every one of the pieces. And when he got to end rate culture, he asked his father, what is that? I don't understand those words. And we'll talk about that later. And the chills up and down my spine. Oh, how fabulous. That's what I wanted to do. Get people talking. Yeah. So it was so rewarding. So yeah. I have spoken enough. I will mute myself and move on to the next. Oh, no, that's great. Thank you so much. Thank you. You know, and I, that's why I do art. When I first shaved my head, I opened up for the brewery art walk and um, a little girl, I think it was a little girl came in with her parents and she looked at me and she's like, are you a boy? And I'm like, no, I'm a girl. And she's like, oh, okay. And I said, girls can have short hair. And so they left, her and her parents left. And a couple minutes later, she runs back in and she's like, my dad was a headbanger. He had long hair. So it's like they left and they were talking about it. And so, it, you know, yeah, you just open up these conversations that, you know, that are so important and so enriching. And that's why we do art. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, Darlene. Um, all right, Linda. Oh, you're muted, Linda. Uh, okay. There we go. Hi, <laughs> um, thank you, Christine, for choosing my work to be in this show. It's really a powerful show. I haven't been able to spend a lot of time with it yet, but I flipped through it and looked at all the work, and there's a lot of work that I really want to look at a lot more closely. Um, so thank you, everyone, for submitting your work. Um, these pieces I did, I just finished writing a book called Don't Shut Up, and it's about uh, childhood sexual trauma and the uh, effects of that and on a person's life, and I'm an incest survivor, so it's basically a story of my life and how art 
was the major catalyst for healing. So these pieces, and I do a lot of pieces, a lot of drawings using text as the, the line. And these pieces are images of me at age one, one and a half and two. And so that was before the abuse started. So all of these pieces have words that are about what was lost. So, um, so these are all very positive words, words that I thought about what I think about children when I see children at these ages and how they seem to me when they're running around and being crazy and being kids. And so for me, those are all things that I lost at, at a point in my life that I'm striving to get back. And it was a pretty intense um, look at myself to write that book. And I had never done really self-portraits before. And the book has many self-portraits and it was very difficult. But anyway, that's what those are about. And my book's available on amazon.com. <laughs> Do you want to share a link in chat? Uh, if I can figure out how, I will. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you can copy the link from Amazon and uh, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah and paste figure it. out how to do that without losing the yeah <laughs> <laughs> the meeting is the gotcha. Uh, thank you so much, Linda. These are really really powerful work, and you know, and thank you for sharing you know your vulnerability and you know your bravery and you know in doing the book and in talking about what you went through through your art. Well, thanks. You know, it's, that's why we do what we do. It's, you know, for our healing, but also to help others. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Um, all right, Lisa. Let's see. There we go. Hi. Hello. <laughs> Let me see. Can I see the whole thing? Yeah, there you go. Oh, well, um, hi everyone. Um, it's amazing to just um, jump in right where I did it. So serendipitous. I um, was listening to some earlier people and um, I felt like my work is in the occluded text, occluded O-C-C-L-U-D-E-D -E text. Um, the really large one of Fred's and the person before Lori. I really identified with the whole obliteration and the veiling. So um, I keep a journal and I've kept a journal since I was 12. And I've got, I think I've got 500 journals and stay tuned. I, you know how you save dessert for last kind of thing. I, I it's a little bit of a character defect, I think, but um, I'm really looking forward to doing something with them that is a visual or photographic display of, of all of this. I have used them in installation, the inside of the journals, um, the handwriting, and so back to the occluded veiled thing, um, I was at an art retreat and when everybody found out that I write like four hours a day, <laughs> um, they were like, well, why don't you use text? And you know, the funny thing is I've, un I've uncovered some older work where I did use text and I, it felt so obvious to me that I stopped doing it. You know, those weird things you do, the obvious thing, you know, I mm -hmm. wouldn't make that choice now, but that's what I did. And also Basquiat was going around and I just thought, well, you know, come on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now we're back to like, you can do anything, you can do everything, you can do it all at once and stop with the rules. So when they said, why don't you put writing in, I, I just had a little bit of that stop thing. And then I suddenly went, okay, you know, let's take the prompt because it was like a bit of a prompt thing going on at this retreat. Um, and there I started. And once I started, it just like the flood, the floodgates opened. This was the first one I think I did, which is why I call it first words. Um, and because it, I mean, I was, I really didn't like being at this retreat. It was incredible. It was like beautiful snow and all this stuff, but there were some things going on and I was writing like, can I, can I say like F you and yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Fuck you. And this is shit. And, oh my God. I can't you know, like, so that's why when I came in, Lori was saying, I'm so frustrated. I mean, so I, but I wanted to kind of change it. 
And there was someone else there that said, you know, hey, look, if it's 11.20 a.m. and at 11.25, you're thinking this thought, write that all down. So I just played a lot. There's a Japanese guy that did like a date every day in the 60s for like years on end. There's this, this kind of a thing. I also kind of like the abstract expressionists. It's sort of my, you know, that's what we were looking at um, when I was coming on up. And I can't get that out of my head. So it's kind of a Bryce Marden sort of scribble, Cy Twombly kind of thing. Um, and so I needed it to be veiled. I just needed to cover stuff up. And I felt a little weird about it. I felt a little weird about like writing stuff and covering stuff up. But that's why I said this is serendipitous because I was relating to the occluded artist before and then uh, Linda came out with the survivor stuff. I'm a survivor too. I'm really used to being in a veiled context. Um, art got me through my childhood, music, the writing, obviously. Um, I am a survivor and I, I've al al always needed to kind of veil thing. The, th the, 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 the second part of being a survivor is the secret keeping. It's really as disturbing, if not <laughs> as disturbing as the first part of it. Um, and that's it. That's all I have to say. I, I continued to do some of this. This is on paper. There's a little piece of tape down there. Um, I love playing around with install, installation coll uh, collage and work on paper. I'm primarily a painter and I just, you know, it was a lot of fun, but I, I wrestled, I'll shut up soon. I wrestled with um, it being too obvious or it being too much of a go-to for myself. And I think I have to stop that. It's like, during COVID when everybody started painting vases of flowers and they're absolutely gorgeous. And you know, why not? I have cactus in my garden. I wanna start doing plein air cactus paintings. So I'm now giving myself permission. Uh, Christine, thank you for this gorgeous show. You are an exceptional curator, very on point. That was fast <laughs> that you put this together. And I really appreciate you including the beautiful work. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Lisa. Thank you. And thank you for sharing, you know, also for your vulnerability and bravery. And, um, you know, it's I've also I've and I can't wait to see what you do with the journals. <laughs> I mean, I have like I, I'm on actually this is number 16 since 2008. And so I mean, that's nothing compared to 500. But I actually took pages of my journal and I shredded them and I mm. put them in cake, cake, glass cake stands. Um, and it was a Mother's Day show that I was in a few years ago. And um, yeah, and it was all about my eating disorder and my mom. And, you know, that's why we're artists. And that's, I mean, that's why we're creatives is we use our, like, it's our stories and it's to heal. You know, it is therapy, no matter how we do it. And you know, um, and yeah, I mean, I, I think it's great. I was looking in chat. I mean, we all have very similar stories, you know, to tell. And that's why I love artist talks, you know, because that's how we connect and we meet each other and we talk, we're able to talk about it more. And I also would not say it's a character defect at all. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, people are trying to get away from that word also, <laughs> you know, that phrase. So don't even think about it like that. <laughs> well, maybe we can have a journal show. <laughs> yeah, I know. Exactly. Exactly. Um, really, we need to have a journal show. I'm really into this. I do journal drawings and I, I'm just so into the journal thing. But um, yeah, and my mother is where my eating uh, stuff comes from, and that's a whole other journal experience. I, I, yeah. Uncovering this stuff is so, it's like an archaeological dig, and I, I'm just, I'm just really grateful for, like, the material. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. Glad you're part of this. Um, all right, let's see. Jenny. Hello, everyone. Hi, Christine. Thank you so much for putting Hi. this together. Um, oh, you're welcome. I also know how much work goes on behind the scenes, especially when you're doing something solo, because I usually end up doing, <laughs> even in group <laughs> exhibitions, a lot of the work. And I know that there's so much behind the scenes, so I really appreciate it. Um, I think to keep it brief and kind of coherent, I'll just focus on the 2020 vision piece, because um, it's kind of not related to the other three pieces that are more about my Korean American immigrant experience. 
But the 2020 vision, I almost didn't submit this because I felt like in retrospect, even though 2020, we're still feeling the after effects of it. At the time I made this, it felt so fresh and so current and so kind of like uh, revelatory for me. <laughs> and now when I look at it, I'm like, this is so obvious, like this is the most cliche thing. Um, but basically 2020 vision, I started creating in March of 2020, right when the closures happened. And I began to notice that a lot of the ways that we think about our bodies relationships to viruses is just how society is structured in general. You know, there's an us and them. Um, it's very polarized, um, very binary. And so I just came up with these uh, four phrases using this um, metaphor of the, uh, I think it's optician or optometrist eye exam. Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of asking, you know, which lens is clearer. If you wear glasses, um, you say A or B, and they kind of tilt the lens um, at different angles um, to sharpen your vision to see what gives you the most accurate um, vision, I guess. And so the four phrases that are flipped through through these lenses in this kinetic sculpture are um, we are the virus, they are the virus, we resist the virus, and they resist the virus. Um, and at the time that I made this, I was in grad school at CalArts. And so it's a very um, politically oriented um, arts environment. And I was even questioning, like, what is this act of resistance? Is that really just reinscribing this polarized dynamic that it's trying to escape? Um, so it's just you know, this piece just goes through dyads of images that are kind of questioning if we put this framework over calling something the virus, are we just actually perpetuating the thing that we think we're trying to cure and all this stuff? Um, but I think looking back on it now, again, I, I kind of feel like there's so many more aspects to this entire thing that I was investigating that I don't know that I captured in this piece, but I still allow it to kind of exist just in the phase that it's in now, because, you know, it's just part of the process of being an artist is that you improve or that you learn more um, through the work that you make. So, so yeah, I guess that's, that's that piece. <laughs> um, and I'm also, I don't know if I mentioned, since I mentioned it, I'm at CalArts, um, also based in LA County. I don't know if that's true for most people here, but um, yeah, I think Christine, you're definitely here. So. Yeah. I think there's quite a few that are, um, that are from Southern California in the LA area. Mm -hmm. So, um, no, thank you for that. And, you know, everybody should definitely go see, you know, look, take a closer look at, you know, the other three works too, which are, you know, just so relevant, um, just so important. I mean, you know, both of these, even though they're, they may not be, you know, similar, they are, I mean, you know, I mean, they're so relevant to everything going on. And even like when I saw the 2020 vision, you know, I mean, there were so many levels to it. Like I knew 2020, the year 2020 and the virus and stuff, but it's so funny because I wasn't necessarily thinking COVID. I mean, I was actually like the virus of politics, the virus in our computers, the you know, and all of what that means. And also like I wear glasses. So it's like whenever I go to the optometrist and they do that test, I always second, <clears throat> excuse me, there I go again, second guess myself because I, um, hold on. <laughs> um, I second guess myself. I probably should try and talk a little slower too. <laughs> um, because like, I never see the changes. I can like, you know, I can't tell which is more clear. I mean, not really, not, you know, so I guess, and then I'm like, wait, was that right? Am I going to get the right prescription? So mm -hmm. there's a lot in there about like confidence and, and about, um, Oh, what's the word I want to use about, um, like, I mean, you know, just like you, you know, the, we, they, you know, resist the, you know, there's so many different, different ways of looking at it. Are they all right? Or are they all wrong? You know, it's like, I don't know. There's, if that makes sense. It's yeah, like, I think like different nuances and inflections of these words. Yeah. yeah. And I think um, 
also, I think I guess through all of these pieces that are included here, um, I'm also interested in what does it mean to, I, I think a lot of art deals with this, but like, what does it mean to contain your opposite or like, you know, that whole Jungian idea of the shadow self um, and integrating that versus repelling it by calling something a virus or outside. Um, so yeah, the idea of like um, relating to viruses, I was taking this class recently on invasive species um, through this like eco art society or something yeah um, just like kind of embracing this idea that there are species out there that are supposed to be in relation to us invasive or pest like but that's how they're supposed to be <laughs> you know um and even like my relationship to a virus like what rights does a virus have relative to me <laughs> do i have the right to obliterate it i don't know it's just like i think i went down these wormholes with thinking about it all but um but yeah so this is a kind of like a preliminary inquiry into that whole thing um, yeah awesome well keep it going I can't wait to see what else you do but no both of these are really important and um you know don't doubt that even though the 2020 was three years ago now it's still I mean it's still powerful and important so definitely thanks so much <laughs> you're welcome you're welcome well thank you um all right let's see Sherry Hi. Hello. Um, I am based in New York right now, but I lived in LA for seven years. Oh, awesome. And I think there may come a time in the not too distant future when I move back. Yay. <laughs> I love LA in the words <laughs> of Randy Newman. Um, it's interesting that the last project was about 2020 because this project is about 2020. And I was not necessarily, I'm not necessarily someone who uses words in my work either, but I felt it was necessary for this project. And obviously it's about Zoom and our relation to it, how in the beginning we felt, oh my God, this is the best thing ever. I get to leave my house at least virtually. And then after a while, when we do three Zooms in one day and our eyes start to go and, you know, what is going on here? Why am I still doing this? And now that the pandemic is essentially over, we hope, uh, and we're going out and doing things again, I feel I need to add more to this project just because our feelings change again. We couldn't do this tonight without Zoom. Exactly. <laughs> you know, um, and thank you so much, Christine, for doing it. You know, it's thank you for doing the show. Thank you for including me. Thank you for all of it. Um, anyway, part of this project is about Zoom, but my work has tended in the past few years to be a lot about surveillance and privacy. And one of the reasons that I started it was I was at a Zoom, one of many, and they said, we're recording it, but we're not making it accessible to you to preserve the privacy of the attendees, to which I said, what privacy? Mm -hmm. And I started, <laughs> so I started making screenshots of the different Zooms and built these three pieces that are in this show, the faces are obscured. I have more uh, on my website where it's very obvious to see who the people are. And people do recognize themselves. And sometimes they're kind of excited and they giggle. And sometimes they feel their privacy has been invaded. And I say that's good because again, we have to be aware of these things. You know, they can say all they want that they're protecting your privacy by not making this available. No, they're not. I can take a screenshot of you. I can take screenshots of your pictures and do whatever I want with them. I'm not going to, but, you know, the possibility still exists. So it's a multi-part project. Wow. Well, thank you. And I don't know if you saw, I just took like a screenshot. 
<laughs> right in the middle. <laughs> so fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, a lot of people, um, I mean, you know, will do that like artist talks and things. I mean, because when you go to an, and actually this is like a larger conversation about, um, even at art openings, you know, in LA, there are like artists go to openings and take photos all the time of the whole, you know, people in the gallery of friends and nobody gets a say if they're posted or not on social media. I think about that sometimes, you know, right. and it's, I deal with body image and I will just learn to let it go. A couple of people have posted unflattering photos of me, but you know, what are you going to do? So privacy, there's so many different layers to it, but especially on Zoom, you know? Yeah. And um, actually my last project before this one, or two projects before when we were out in the real world, was I photographed people at openings without their knowing that I was doing it. And I, I manipulated them in such a way that I put, um, um, Oh God, I'm losing a word. Um, <laughs> like a filter? <laughs> no, like uh, when they do surveillance uh, photos and they put a, they put a grid on your face oh, to yeah. identify you. So I put grids on the faces and at certain, um, at certain depths, you can see that there's a face there and at other ones you can't. But again, I was photographing people without their permission. Yeah. And no, one no and no one notices because we're all taking pictures all the time. So exactly. Yeah. And yeah, especially, I mean, as far as Zoom goes, like you said, you know, I we wouldn't have this. We wouldn't be meeting you in New York. You know, exactly. without it. And I still, I mean, I am still one of those people. This is my third zoom meeting today on a Saturday and tomorrow I have one two three four I have five <laughs> so wow. I'm still one of those people yeah who's uh you know who's on zoom quite a bit but it's you know I don't know it's it, that's a whole other issue I'm working on <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's a wonderful thing that we can actually yeah you know connect with each other I've been in Zooms where there are people all over the world were there. Yep, exactly. Exactly. It makes the world a smaller place. Exactly. Yep. But like, you know, I was telling somebody earlier, it's about balance. You know, it's like, yes, you also need to get outside. And I'm saying this as much for me too. <laughs> <laughs> you still need to get outside. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Sherry. <laughs> and thank you again, Christine. You're welcome. Nice You're welcome. To meet you. you too. <laughs> One day uh, in the real world. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> All right, Monica. What an amazing show. I, this has really opened my eyes to different ways text can be used that I just wouldn't have even thought about. It's just really it's amazing pieces. Um, so I, I do love using text in my work, and I will often use a ton of it or very little. So thank you for including all three pieces that show when I've done both of the, those things. <laughs> so um, this piece is uh, a more recent piece than the other two. And the words say, but you seem so normal. And this is what happens when I tell people sometimes um, that I have uh, that I'm, I have aut autism spectrum disorder, or I have, um, also been diagnosed with social anxiety um, and that I have mental illness. And um, I'm kind of burying myself when I share those things, this is my little naked torso. Um, and, and people, they don't actually say the word normal, but in, in saying it without actually saying it, you know, it's like, they really, you, no, I don't think you do. I love when people debate you about something you tell them about yourself. Like, no, you don't. Um, well, how do I <laughs> respond to that? <laughs> yes, I, I do. Um, and you're making it worse? I don't know. Anyway, um, so this little figure is in a, in a, in a pot and uh, like a cooking pot. 
And uh, it was just, sometimes I will use words to what I hear other people saying um, to me. And this is one of those cases. And um, it's not a big piece, it's a little piece, but yeah. So I guess that's, a, that's about it, just, oh. <laughs> but you seem so normal. Um, and then this was a piece from a, a while ago uh, about climate change when climate change was, was still called global warming. And, um, and it was just hitting the like, uh, you know, the general public kind of thing. Um, for those people who weren't, you know, scientists or following science directly many years ago, we, we started hearing about it more and more and more. And um, I, I love nature and I love being in nature. And I hate to think that, like, <laughs> I thought things would be a lot better by now. Um, and I just looked up like every word that had to do with climate change or environmentalism. And if I didn't know what the word was, I, I looked it up and I found, don't test me now because it was a while ago. Um, but so it was a process for me to learn more about the earth and, and the figure in the middle, which is kind of a mother earth figure. Um, and that these are all, all words that others should learn too. And I was hoping that when you know, people would see it and they go, oh, I wonder what that is. And they would look, look it up too. And that we're affected. And it is, it's like, it's all around us. You know, this is all, this is all happening to the point of no return. And it's, it's a very heavy issue. It's something that, that troubles me deeply every day. And um, so that's what this piece was. And it was my, you know, filling every spot, every, you know, there's very little negative space in this because it's so, it's like, you can't not, if people that don't see it, that deny it, I have another piece called climate change denier. I, I didn't submit it, but I mean, it's like, they kind of go together. Um, so for me, how do you not see this? This is like in your face, not like the other one where you kind of have to look in to see what it was, you know, with the, but you look so normal. It's not like out there because that's me, but this is the, this is our world. And how do you, you know, so it's like, I did as many as possible, um, which is similar to the next piece, <laughs> which is another, which is about, um, homeless communities and, and at the time the unhoused term wasn't being used. Um, and this was in 2020, which is interesting that was the theme of today. Um, and these are actual um, headlines from articles. Every single one of these was an actual headline uh, around this time in 2020 that I, I printed out on this paper. Um, and the piece is called Don't Erase Me. And unfortunately, it didn't photograph that well, but there's, there's items inside that like are, are common that you see. There's like a boot and, and other things that you might see in a, in a homeless encampment. Um, and how the, the found, and I use found objects a lot. So the objects I use have to do with uh, difficulty finding affordable housing and difficulty, you know, like it's just out of reach. You're just the people that are like living paycheck to paycheck could have it taken away from them at any moment. And now that the um, the COVID mor moratorium on uh, rent increases and, and and evictions is over, you know, it's it's playing out again. Where you know it's like just either a risk of losing or the difficulty of getting that key, that house key. Um, and that, and it's another thing, I guess there's a theme here of like, because a lot of my work is about shining a light on the things people don't want to see. And, and I think all these three pieces are, are about that too, where, you know, it, but both of the, the last two pieces are like, you, you can't not see it anymore. You know, how do you not, there, it's an epidemic. You know, the other one is an environmental epidemic. And this is, a homeless epidemic and it's 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 horrible and there's a lot of violence 
you know, I put both positive and negative headlines in this and the um, it's it's just it's everywhere and 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 it is the origins of the problem are so are so many years behind us that you know band-aids aren't going to fix it and that the the title of it don't erase me is really important to me because um you know these are actual people when you other a community you don't see them anymore and um and I feel like the homeless have often been othered and erased. And so uh, this is another one where I used lots of words. Um, but again, I didn't come up with these words um, either. These are actual uh, articles. And um, and there's I, I did this on a pressed board and I cut into the board. And then I put another little square into it. It's kind of hard to see in the picture, but it's got a lot more dimension than you can see in the picture as well. Um, and that was another thing I wanted. I wanted a little depth and I wanted like something, you, you might be able to tell that I like playing with depth, <laughs> things that you have to go further in to look at and things that you see when you're farther away from it. Um, and I think that's about it. Awesome, well, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Monica. It, uh, you know, all three works are so powerful. And um, yeah, I mean, so much meaning for everything that's going on today. So thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. All right, B. Hi, everybody. Um, I hope you can hear me. I'm calling from outside in New York um, on the waterfront. I'm actually in tech for a show right now, so I could only drop in for a minute. I'm projection designer for a theater show here. So, um, but I'll keep it quick because I got to run back in. Um, Thank you so much for including me in the show um, and uh, accepting these works. Um, it's really beautiful to see everyone else's work. Um, the first three on the top are uh, works that I did, uh, coll digital collage, um, actually in one of the shoebox call and response um, sessions, or I don't know if they're sessions, but <laughs> um, times that Christine was running for a while and the theme was text. And so um, I actually don't use text in my digital collage very often. And so this was really fun to do. Um, the first one has to do with my body, um, thinking about my shadow and is that part of my body? And, you know, like if we think about energy and aura and, and the space around our body, how we connect with others, you know, where is it really that your body ends and someone else begins or something else begins. Um, the middle one is a poem that I wrote um, about uh, kind of the threads of grief and loss and memory and trying to bring it together. And it's juxtaposed with a, um, a loom, a photo of a loom. Um, and then the last one is just kind of reflecting on the anxiety of, of wartime and um, yeah. And, and, you know, so like we think that war is, was a long time ago, but actually we're in it right now. Uh, it's still happening. Um, and then the two videos, um, the first one is a highlights reel of my uh, master's thesis show, which was an installation and immersive experience for grief processing. And I actually use text in a number of locations, mostly as a way to uh, communicate with my audience. Um, to uh, invite them to engage. Um, the first part of it, I invited them to write down something that they wanted to let go of and let it dissolve in water. Um, there's a middle section where there's projection on the floor that was inviting them to move in the circle of the words. Um, and there were, there, were also, uh, there were also text hanging from the ceiling that were a collection of my personal notebooks and uh, documents and books um, that I was studying when I was thinking about grief and death. And then the final piece um, is a short video that can be looped. Um, it's a collage uh, when I was working on my written master's thesis um, and was in the editing process. And I had this long, long Google doc that I was scrolling through and I kind of got lost in it. And so I created this collage when I was kind of processing the overwhelm of trying to finish this massive document. Um, and yeah, those are the, the works that are in the show. But um, yeah, thank you. This was really fun. And I look forward to watching the recording um, to hear other people's statements.
Thank you so much, B. I'm so glad you were able to drop in. And thank you. You know, I love the thesis works, the um, especially like, you know, I remember writing my thesis and, <laughs> you know, just like getting lost. And, you know, thankfully I found the find button, you know, the control F or whatever it is where you could search for words. Oh my God, I didn't know about it back then. And, you know, but yeah, I mean, just like the, the monotony of writing a thesis and reading it. And uh, so I love that video. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Got to run. Okay, bye. <laughs> All right, back run. Yes, hi. Thank you very much. Uh, You're welcome. Intimidated by this show, but uh, honored to be part of it. Uh, so all of these pieces are part of one project, an ongoing cumulative project. Uh, I change the name of it occasionally, but basically it's burn pile. <laughs> and uh, this this image right here is the is the installation. It's in this form here. It was about thirty feet long by um, eight or ten feet high, or something like that. Um, it, but it all derives from uh, something I started before COVID. So it was a a small soundproof booth that I took around and with a microphone in it and a, and a screen. And I was asking people to donate some truth statement by speaking into the microphone. And then it would immediately, I had a friend develop a code that would immediately randomly scramble about a third of their words with words from previous donors. And uh, it would come up on the screen and they, all they could do about it was either delete it or accept it with the understanding that I would then make use of their words. So, so that's kind of the background to this whole thing that it's, uh, it's either a clash of truths or a blending or um, really the way I see it, it's, it's uh, hopefully finding a space outside of truth <laughs> where, where everyone's comfortable together, possibly. Um, so some, and I'm, I'm just, over the years, I'm, I'm, Playing with every way I can, I can use these things and and rescrambling them and stuff like that. So this what's on the screen right now are, are um, what I consider commemorative paper plates. Uh, so I take, you know, I choose bits of these these scrambled. I have pages and pages and pages of these scrambled statements. So I do it as if they were, you know, precious heirloom plates, things like that. Uh, also, I use a lot of LED signs in different forms. These tiny ones are really fun to work with. They're, they're badges, you know, meant for conventions and stuff like that. Um, and they're just running a, a stream of, of these scrambled statements. Um, also on the, on this uh, lumber pieces. So this would be a door. All these things are parts of the pile. Um, so you can see the, the writing on this one is mostly on the broken windows, which are made with aluminum foil on gator board. Uh, and often I, I do the writing over this wood grain. The wood grain is all done with relief prints, um, which I then mount on paper and, and kind of build this, this uh, collapsed building with. And a lot of that I've written on. And what I've done with that often is is outline the spaces between the words, um, which uh, in my mind is kind of getting at the uh, the space on the other side of truth. Uh, so I think I think that's all. Oh well, yeah, this is. If you look closely at this, you can see that these uh, these pieces are meant to represent the undersides of dining tables, uh, and. Uh, Oh yeah, and I think I think one one thing that's fun about this is you can get in there and figure out what's written, but but it's not going to tell you what people were saying. <laughs> so it's it's uh it's many layers of of obscuring. Same on this here. No, it's a wonderful project. Thank you. And there's a couple of videos also. That's right. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. I I also made pinatas shredding people's statements. Um, I also, for a while, I gave, uh, I, I uh, asked people to fill out questionnaires and then and put them in a shredder. 
<laughs> asking increasingly invasive questions. Uh, and that's, that's part of what goes into this too. Thank you very much. I okay. really, really appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. No, Thank it's you. such a, you know, a unique, clever project. And just the, you know, I mean, I love that everything is handmade, you know, that's everything. Right. Yeah. I, like, I, wanted, I wanted it to have that sincerity aspect to it. I thought. Yeah. That was, that was yeah. And that it's including electronics too. You know, you're including the LEDs. Right. Which is really great. Well, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Let's see. Um, and then Dougie. Uh, hi. <laughs> First of all, I, I I am blown away by everybody. I had no idea. I mean, I've seen other text-based and word-based art exhibitions. But this has such a huge, diverse, uh, the mediums are just blowing me away. I mean, I had no idea what can be done <laughs> with text and words. So I, first of all, I want to thank you for including me in the show. And then I want to thank all the other artists for really inspiring me. I mean, I, I have a feeling I'm going to be looking back at this and I hope it's still going to be available online later because yeah. I want to save it and really you know, play with, you know, more experimentation, just kind of based on what you all are doing. And yeah, I'm, I'm totally inspired and blown away. I mean, some of the ideas I never would have thought of, you know, like the three-dimensional stuff and it's just amazing. And I love words and I've been using them in my work on and off um, for, for many years. So the, the first piece actually, uh, the piece one, uh, that was from a series. I'm originally from Berlin. I grew up in West Berlin during the Cold War. <laughs> and so this piece is actually um, from a Berlin Wall series that I did that was a little autobiographical, but I used a model to basically take the place of me. I didn't want to do a bunch of self-portraits. And I placed it in front of the uh, remnants of the actual Berlin Wall. So some of the graffiti is the real graffiti that is still found on some of the pieces or from old photos that I had from before when the wall was still up. Uh, and then some I also just added, you know, from other sources to it that are a little bit more personal. Um, and because it has the word uh, peace, Frieden, and however you say that in, in Russian mirror, I guess. <laughs> um, you know, when I did this, this was a few years ago. And of course, then I kind of started putting this piece out there again because it's so it's so timely now, unfortunately, with the war yet again. Mm -hmm. um, so that that is what what this and this was actually one of my biggest pieces. I work in pastel, so all of this is pastel. There's no spray paint or anything on it. It's all pastel, and it's about forty by sixty. So that's actually a really big piece for me. Um, the other work. Um, you want to go to the next one? I can't remember which is the next one. Okay, so this one has an actual word in it, but then it has also the, and I want to ask you, Christine, because I used to call it acemic writing, but English is not my first language, so maybe I've been pronouncing it wrong, and you meant, you said something else. How was it actually pronounced? You know, Asymic good question. Something like that? Um, okay. Yeah, good question. I, I've actually only seen it, I don't know if I've heard it, I know. See, I haven't either. So maybe yeah. it is like asymmetric or something. I, I have no idea if anybody knows yeah. how to pronounce that word. But basically, that that writing is all not real writing. Uh, and I saw an exhibition in Berlin uh, where this artist and I'm, I'm drawing a blank on her name, but she had done that type of writing on. And I'm sorry, my phone is ringing. Um, had done that type of writing in a huge gallery directly on the wall. And I was so mesmerized by that because it looked like words, but there weren't words. And your, your brain wanted to fill it in. You know, I wanted to read something. Uh, and I was just absolutely fascinated. And that was the first piece that I did after that. And this model actually uh, was photographed in Berlin as well. And what was a little, a little, yeah, and a little hard about this piece, I had photographed the model, I had the chaos, which is part of the Berlin Wall um, graffiti that I had come across, and I had saved the different images, I wanted to use them together, but hadn't really figured out how, so about a year and a half go by, and I finally had, had the vision of, okay, this is what I want to do. The day I finished that 
piece was when, um, I don't know if you all remember the Christmas market massacre that happened in Berlin mm -hmm. when a terrorist drove a truck into the Christmas market and killed a bunch of people. I finished it that day. I remember posting it and seeing the news and this model was placed, it, I mean, that is where I photographed him. Wow. Like exactly on that spot where the massacre happened. So it was a really personal, hard thing, but uh, I'm, I'm glad I, I finished it that day. So that was a weird, uh, what is it, syn synchronicity? Yeah. Uh, so. Yeah, and then I think that I have another piece that also has that acemic writing on it. Yeah, this one right here. So this is actually uh, one piece of two. This one is called The Power of Protest. And the, um, the, the sister piece to go with it is called The Betrayal of Silence. And that probably says it all. And again, that's acemic writing in the background, which is so much harder than I thought to actually do. <laughs> Because I think we are so used to wanting to, to make words and letters. So some of them look more like actual letters than others. But yeah, it's very hard to do. But it's fun. And, and I love that it looks like text, but it's not really text. So it kind of allows the viewer also to bring in their own idea of what it might say. Totally. And then this one is, uh, yeah, the next two pieces are basically, um, I, I had a show um, with one other artist, and it was um, it was called E Pluribus Unum, and out of many, one is what that stands for, and it was a, more of a political show, and this was all, we worked on the, the paintings uh, kind of during the time of all the protests and everything, and uh, this is about the 14th Amendment, <laughs> and then this is the same model that I uh, used for this piece, um, and I call this piece uh, Blind Justice with the question mark. And I think that's pretty obvious too of what, what I'm trying to say with that one. And that's again, all, all pastel. And I think that's that's all I had in there. Or is there one more? I can't remember. Yeah, yeah that's it. But yeah, I just want to thank you all because this has been so inspirational to me. I, I can't wait to really take my time to look through everything, watch all the videos, and I'm just blown away by everybody's work. So thank you for including me in this. I absolutely love this show. Thanks, Christine. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you, Dougie. No, your work, you know, it's so important and it fits perfectly with all the rest of the work. And no, I'm really, you know, honored that you're in the show. So thank you. <laughs> Um, Deborah, are you there? Did you want to uh, sure. Sure. Thank you, Christine. Um, I was going to say Deborah. Christine, oh, one and the same. Um, <laughs> for your patience with going in and out, I was just determined to just show up and, and be there for you and, and hear everybody else as well today. Um, and being someone who works and has worked intensively over a number of years in the form of the book, text is sort of something that um, would be a natural, um, but I've been very careful with it. Um, it is something that I, I didn't want it to become like a trope. Um, it, the, the piece that I, uh, any given piece that I would be working on, it had to really kind of demand text. Um, and I'm, I'm also very aware, as I think some other folks have, have alluded to, that um, uh, image is text and text is image in a way. You know, you're using lines to create um, words. And um, that, that could also be seen as a, as a drawing. But of course, the meaning of those words um, is, is critical. Um, Otherwise, you know, why have them in there? So the small flag book, um, the text is part of the Jewish. Uh oh, you may have cut out, Deborah. Are you there? Oh, still can't hear you. How about now? Oh, yep. There we go. <laughs> okay. I just left the car. Oh. Um, I really hear you, Christine, about you're just not going to be doubling or tripling up on things anymore. <laughs> and I, I, I totally agree. 
So the small flag book. Um, uh, Is that said, this one? Yes. Okay. I said yes before I saw it, but yes. Oh. Um, um, all the world's a narrow bridge. The important thing is not to fear. I might be paraphrasing. That is part of the um, Jewish Rosh Hashanah liturgy. And I think it's just a really, you know, couldn't be more salient to just about every single. Uh, cutting out again, Deborah. Are you there? Can you hear me now? Oh, yep. <laughs> okay, I'm just gonna stand right here. Um, <laughs> okay. The world's a narrow bridge, the important thing is not to fear. Very related, Christine, to the quote you used from George O'Keefe in your signature line about, I've been absolutely terrified, you know, because, yeah. it, you know, and I think that this only gets more salient with every passing day, with a lot of the issues that many of the other artists have talked about and just the basic anxiety about taking control, um, and living. Um, so I think it's interesting that when you write something, sometimes you are able to meet it. If it contains a fear, you're able to meet it. And using stitching, you make the text integral or integral uh, to the work uh, somewhat in a different way. You're, you're making it part of the cloth, you know, in my case. Um, so that's an early work from, I think, 2016. And then the tapestry that has the repeated phrases uh, really relates to the same thing um, called hopes and fears and, which I feel, you know, you hope that something doesn't happen. You fear and you hope at the same time um, that, you know, you don't have to confront whatever danger, et cetera. So I just, I had these, um, these tapestry squares and um, I stitch them together and then put the text in, um, in, a, in just over and over and over again. So it's sort of the idea of, it's a little bit reverbing to when you were punished in school, sometimes the teacher would make you <laughs> mm -hmm. write something over and over and over again on the, on the board. Um, but it's kind of the reverse of that because it's, it's again, trying to grapple with uh, the fear and the hope that I think we all carry and, um, you know, to respond to that, to try to move through it by, by confronting it, by stitching it right into the piece. Definitely. And then uh, the, the next piece on the denim, um, uh, Concurrencies One, um, Eva Hess and, or Charlotte Salomon and Eva Hess is part of a larger project I did um, comparing and contrasting the two artists, Charlotte Salomon and Eva Hess, um, both very much affected by the Holocaust, uh, the Jewish Holocaust in World War II, but also some very intense family issues. And uh, I had committed through my Santa Monica Fellowship to doing this research and noting it. And I thought, well, there's so many people who've written amazing books about these artists. Why should I simply you know, type out or write down um, my sort of rehashing of other people's research. So I distilled a lot of the um, commonalities or concurrencies that um, I felt uh, between the two artists on an emotional level through my research. And I stitched them um, through single words such as mother or repetition, as well as phrases, uh, actually quotes um, from the artists. Um, and I had had this substrate, I had put this hanging denim piece together and um, uh, it worked very well um, as a substrate for, uh, for expressing um, just these, these amazing artists and how they, they move through the most extraordinary challenges uh, through the creative process. Oh. And then the last one, unfolding possibilities. So they're all a sort of different impetuses and using text in different ways. So Christine, I really appreciate you putting this diversity of works in that engage text. This was a um, project that I did through 18th Street Arts Center where I had led a workshop um, uh, 
teaching folks during the pandemic online to create this um, uh, double flowerful book and asking then uh, those folks as well as the community in general to submit words that they felt uh, expressed their experience of the pandemic. And then I made a very large book and unfolds to, I think, six feet. So, um, and I put all those words together, found a common font and did sort of a layout. I printed them all out and, um, uh, and then stitched them again into the piece so they became integral. And you can't really see in this particular shot, but <laughs> there is, um, there were a lot of words that were similar, but there were also words that were completely opposite, like um, going inward and, and going outward. And I thought that was really, really you know, fascinating. So the idea was that it would become sort of a document of that moment and um, engage the community through the sewing and the bookmaking. Um, so it really is a collaboration of sorts um, with the community, with those words. So thank you, thank you for including me and for not only doing the show, but making the effort to present this event. You're very welcome. Thank you for being part of it and for sharing your beautiful and important work. Um, again, you know, the use of text as mark making, you know, using sewing, using, you know, not the pencil or the pen or the marker or, you know, but another, another media, um, I think is just so important. And, you know, just another way that we communicate our, our hopes and fears, like you said, and, and the possibilities. I mean, yeah, just thank you so much for your work. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Um, all right. Anybody else that hasn't gone want to want to go? Let's see. Ian, are you? Oh, there we go. <laughs> I saw you waving, but <laughs> or clapping. Yeah. Um, awesome. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, for including me in in the show, I'm grateful to be here, and it's uh, it's been a pleasure to see all the um, varieties and different ways in which people have explored uh, using using text. Um, it's uh, it's given me a, a sort of a a new outlook in a way. I I kind of get holed up in my studio, and um, I don't think I look out, you know out of the window enough to look at art and I kind of get consumed in my own work. So uh, seeing the diversity has been a real, a real pleasure. Like, oh, wow, you know, I didn't see myself making that. That looks really cool. And I didn't see this variation. That's really cool. So a lot of inspiring um, variations. Um, so I'm grateful to see that. And thank you again for including uh, my work in this show. Um, well, I guess uh, basically you touched on some of the features uh, that I approach in the work, which is um, I try to use, and I think Deborah has mentioned this and has been mentioned by some other uh, of the artists in the show, uh, to take text and use it as a design tool or an actual physical object uh, where it's being braided and utilized for its shape. Um, I've been researching text for about 20 some odd years. so. Uh, my work with it spans um, a pretty good spectrum of, I think, uh, ways in which you can look at handling text and then not in my own work, essentially for a lot of it, but for through research and seeing explorations in text through Islamic writing or Kufic writing or, uh, you know, um, Chinese characters or Japanese script, uh, looking at English, looking at German, looking at European forms, um, all all very intriguing. Uh, and what I pulled from it, and I think someone mentioned this too, is that uh, text is an image. So it is an abstraction uh, that represents a picture. Uh, so in that sense, I try to then repicture that idea in the work. And then over the years, it's become a little bit more complex where I want, I, I think of it in a sense of taking a walk where I see a tree branch and I see the shadow fall across the tree branch and hit the tree that brings me closer to the subject matter. Uh, so how could I take text and create that environment where seeing the object as it performs as text 
that you would pronounce a shape because once you see it, you can't unsee it. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you become defamiliarized to the subject. So then that perhaps that too would bring you closer to uh, that line of sight, right? That you're having that experience with this thing that you think is familiar becomes unfamiliar. Um, so a little bit of contradiction. Um, I probably won't be able to express everything I'd want to talk about uh, the work uh, um, because it gets away from me sometimes. But uh, that's the general that's the general nuance with the work that and a sort of textile element, an element of spectacle, uh, an element of tactility. Uh, uh, the the fact that you would glimpse a letter, a shape, a word, and then it would sort of recollapse back into form, shape, and pattern. Um, those are some of the uh, the tendencies that I'm trying to keep in mind um, when I when I when I work through these uh, little pieces that and uh, I I think too um, to at least to Deb some of Deborah's work is that there's a it's not page by page but there's a book like quality to the narrative structure uh, that I'm trying to um, claim a little bit of right that the moment's happening that you're reading but then the reading kind of dissolves. Uh, and then you have to sort of enter in a different a different way, um, and that's definitely part of it as well. Um, that's about it. Uh, uh, and I'm sure I'm dropping a whole lot because I usually do, and I just don't. Um, it's helpful helpful for me more or less to think about what people ask than to um, have sort of a, a a monologue right or, or a, a speech about the work. Um, and I spent a lot of time writing and trying to cultivate. Uh, um, my ideas, which I find easier because I trap them, right? And they're a little bit more still and I can go back and hack out the things I don't think appropriate the ideas that I want. Um, so how about, oh, so that's another part. So writing and rewriting. So writing is always rewriting. So, uh, and a lot of this is about scratching out, cutting away, excavating, uh, finding room to put another piece in that I think will lead me somewhere else. And that's why they tend to sprawl, uh, um, because I don't necessarily want them to end. <laughs> I want I want to keep uh, I want to keep working through the process. Uh, but I know um, at some point it has to stop. Uh, so um, I usually abandon certain pieces, or I I get I get um, uh, sidetracked because a new idea will, will pop in my head, and I'm like, oh, I should try this, you know. And if I don't, I feel if I don't, uh, it'll get lost. So that's about it. Yeah, well, thank you so much. And like um, Deborah said, you know, asked if there's a graffiti influence, which you can stuff tagging graffiti. Absolutely. Um, I I did spend some time, uh, which I think did have a profound, a, a profound influence on me, as I did live. Uh, I spent a little time in North Africa, so I would see a lot of Kufic, a lot of um, Islamic calligraphy on the buildings. Uh, I was entranced because for the culture, there is no figuration uh, in their writing, in a sense, in their houses of worship, right? So then you see the dynamic play of uh, geometry, the woven nature of the language, and then how the language itself, if you've seen Arabic writing, uh, it has a spirit. Um, uh, I don't claim to know that when you look at graffiti, that those things, because we have a sort of global connection or how other people are influenced by that the cursive or the script of the form. Um, but obviously, you know, if I look back at uh, abstract expressionist work or I look back at early works, you, you know, that dynamic's always apparent in the action, the gesture, right? The power of that movement. Um, I, love, uh, I love the movement of the work. I think the writing obviously uh, sort of exaggerates or expounds on that movement by placing it and framing it as art. Um, uh, but yeah, that's definitely, Graffiti is definitely something that would uh, enter my mind as well. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you. I mean, you know, there, like you, you know, you said it. There's so many different layers to, you know, to the work, and I, you know, you could see the erasure, the, you know, and the, the layering as far as wait, what, what is forward, what's backward, you know, what's behind, what's, you know, what should I look for first? And yeah, it was just, the work was so intriguing to me and it definitely stuck out. And, you know, so thank you. It's, it's really wonderful work. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I'm grateful. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, all right. I think, did we get everybody?
Um, I think so. Everybody that wants to. So um, let's see. I guess now everybody's probably waiting. Um, so one person from the exhibition will get an online solo exhibition um, in a few months. And um, I and it was very, very hard. I mean, you know, I chose everybody. I love all of the work and, um, you know, and I tried to, you know, um, yeah, I mean, the, there were so many, so many things to think about. Um, but in the end, I, um, I decided to give the solo show to Jenny Park. So um, thank you. No, Jenny. Really? <laughs> Um, um, we will, yeah, I'll get in touch with you. We'll talk about, um, it, it, it may not be work from this, you know, from what you've shared, it could be something else that you've done. Um, so we'll talk about that. Okay. Thank you so much. That's so shocking. <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome. No, I mean, you know, definitely go back and look at her work, look at all of her work. You know, it's just so important and, and it's also personal. I mean, it's universal. It's like, you know, and uh, yeah, you can just see, yeah, so much of that. So take a look at it. Um, thank you all so, so much for being part of the exhibition and for being here today. And, you know, like I said, this is why I love artist talks. It's like, there's just, you know, I mean, it was really inspiring and empowering and, you know, and enlightening to hear all of the stories and to realize that, you know, we're, I mean, we're all different, but we all we're to all telling similar stories and yeah, and that's that's why I love art. So thank you very much. And um, I will have the video on YouTube um, later on today and then I'll put it in the exhibition. So the exhibitions on shoeboxprojects.com.com <laughs> underneath current exhibitions. And so the artist talk will be at the top later on today. So if you want to share it with anybody, um, so yeah, and then I'll send an email also letting you know with the chat. So that way you can go back and follow everybody and, you know, get emails or websites and stuff like that. So um, I hope to see you all out and about somewhere sometime and, um, you know, take care, keep creating, you know, keep getting your work out there because it is important and we need to see it. So thank you. So enjoy the rest of your day, everybody. Thank you. So You're welcome. You're welcome. And I'll be in touch, Jenny. Okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you.